Dr. Krauss, welcome to Real Science Friday. Why do you think there is something rather than nothing? <laughs> because we can see it, first of all. I'm pretty sure there's not nothing. Yeah, that's... Uh, I, I'm reasonably certain empirically that that's a fact. Yeah, the there fact may... we're on the telephone today is, is a good example. Yes, there um, are people I debate who would go off on a tangent at that point and deny that we could know anything, but I'm glad that you agree there is something. Oh, there absolutely is, yes. And... Uh, then uh, the question, the amazing thing is uh, how it's really, the, you know, for, from a scientific perspective, the really important thing is a how question, not a why question. Um, because what we really want to know is how everything we see, the galaxies of the 100 billion galaxies in the observable universe, each containing 100 billion stars, uh, creating a Big Bang 13.7 billion years ago, how all of that arose. Uh, potentially from nothing. And what is the amazing thing is when we look at the universe and measure what we've measured, uh, it is perfectly consistent with a universe that could spontaneously arise due to the laws of quantum mechanics from literally nothing. The total energy of the universe appears to be zero, which of course is kind of the, what you might expect of a universe that came from nothing. And everything we've discovered seems to point in that direction. Now, it's only a plausibility argument. We don't, we don't know the laws of physics back to t equals zero or before. We, we, we know it pretty close. We've been able to by, but with our machines in, in, at the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva, um, uh, recreate the conditions of the universe back to about a millionth of a millionth of a second after the Big Bang, mm. uh, and have made some recent discoveries of a major new particle the, well, uh, there. And so, but but what we what we've been able to say is that plausibly, yeah. it's certainly plausible, and it look, doesn't look like there's any need for any supernatural shenanigans. Now, the now, simple laws of physics will do it. Now, Lawrence Krauss, you know, as I've just introduced myself that I'm the pastor of Denver Bible Church. Yes. So if I end up disagreeing with you on a point, and you're able, with your knowledge, to confirm that there are many scientists who would agree with me, could you let the audience know? Because I might need your help in refuting you. Sure, yeah, as long <laughs> as we're, I mean, but yeah, if, if we're talking science. Yeah, absolutely. if we're talking science, you're a best-selling author. So I'd like to say to you that this is a well-written book, but that's a bit like telling a girl you met on a blind date that she has a great personality. <laughs> because I so disagree with what you write. But between you and Richard Dawkins, you guys concede fully half of the argument to us creationists and well, to well, the intelligent hold on a Let's just design back folks. And say, how can you, I mean, yeah. the question is do you disagree with the science? And if so, what, uh, what's your science? I, I, I love the science. Oh. I'm an amateur. I'm a radio talk show host for 22 years, okay. five days a week. I've debated people like Michael Shermer, mm -hmm. Eugenie Scott. Back in the 90s, mm -hmm. Eugenie Scott was on with me for an hour, and she said the best evidence for evolution was junk DNA. And I said, the Bible teacher, I said, well, Eugenie, don't you think it's too early in our study of genetics to conclude affirmatively that all this non-coding, all those regions are junk? And she said, we have it. We, we sell the DVD. She said, we absolutely know affirmatively that it has no function. Now fast forward 15 years, and it's the Bible pastor who was right. Well, and one I mean, of the people, world's leading okay. atheists who was wrong. Scientist. Well, first of all, Jeannie isn't a, a, a geneticist. No, she, secondly, the, I. I mean, the, the, I'm a little worried when, ever, when people make a mistake and say something, then suddenly it doesn't mean the science is wrong. It means the scientist is wrong. Well, I agree but, with that. But, I agree but, with um, that. You know, right. to say we affirmatively, it, it, I'm surprised Jeannie would say that because in science we generally cannot. Right. For, for, regarding things we don't yet understand, we can't affirmatively uh, argue with certainty. About anything. Well, th well, that's a great point. But you guys have, like you and Richard Dawkins, you guys appeared on stage together recently. Mm -hmm. You guys have fully conceded half of our argument. Well, I, I, right? I don't know which half. Well, I mean, okay, the, let me the, let me tell the, you. The universe had a beginning. If you want to go there, no, I'll, I'll, I'll agree with that. Richard Dawkins repeats everywhere he speaks that biology is the study of things that appear to be designed. And to explain what appears to be, on your part, the exquisite design of our universe, you believe that there are trillions of universes so that ours appears beautifully designed just by dumb luck. Because well, if you have second. septillions... Well, let's stop a second. I yeah. don't even use the word believe. Scientists don't use the word believe. I don't believe anything. What the question is, what does the data tell me? What's more likely? What's less likely? What's been ruled out by the data? And in fact, the universe is not a particularly exquisitely designed for us. 
it's exquisitely designed to exist. It could be a lot better. In fact, we probably live in the worst of all universes for the long-term future of life. Yeah, we're, we're able to observe. Space is non-zero. If it was zero, the universe would be better. Dr. Krauss, from our position, you say the sun is in an insignificant corner of our galaxy. From our position, unlike the vast majority of stars in our Milky Way, we are able to observe not only the Milky Way to an extraordinary degree, but the entire universe. We have such an extraordinary opportunity because of where we are. Well, it's not unique in by how you're right. We're lucky. We're actually, in fact, we're unlucky in a way. Yeah. We can observe the rest of the universe, but we can't observe most of our own galaxy. So it just well, depends. If we I mean, were... it's, like, it's like someone who lives on the other side of the track that's always yeah. greener. Well, and yeah, so, but if we were in the cluster, we right? We can see, but we are very unlucky. We can't see what we can't see. If we were in the cluster where most of the stars are in the center of our spiral galaxy, there would be so much interference, we might not be able to see hardly anything. Well, you know, the point is, we we don't exactly know, the, first of all, the conditions, uh, what what life would be like, for right. example, there. And you're absolutely right that if we were right in the center of our galaxy, probably, not only would we not be able to observe anything, but it'd probably be pretty hard for life to have evolved. But we, because we're in the outskirts of the galaxy, uh, which is probably true for only, say, maybe 30 billion of the 100 billion stars in our galaxy. So we're one of 30 billion lucky stars, if you want to call it that, and, and that's fine. But, I mean, again, it's one of these things where it's, it would be very surprising for us to find ourselves in a place we couldn't live. Do you agree with that? Well, it that, very, that's surprising for us to find ourselves Lawrence, being involved. That, in a, that's it, like a doctor saying the reason your father is deaf is because he can't hear. No, it's not. It's, yes, I mean, it's, it's so same. much you, like you that. Agree. that you know, very, it's not too surprising that we find ourselves in a place that's conducive for life. Well, Do you agree with that statement? I, I think that's a non sequitur. It's, well, uh, it, it's, that's a, it's, it's a, a word game to try it's, to... It's a tautology, not a non sequitur. Well, well, right. The extraordinary unlikelihood, the fine-tuning of the physical properties of the universe, and then the extraordinary unlikelihood... What fine-tuning you're talking about? I mean, I, I, you sound like you're an expert in this, and I assume you're not, but you're just, you're just spouting off some words that you've heard, so I'd like to know what fine-tuning you're talking about. All right. I've been doing the show for 22 That's years, fine, five days a week. I'll, 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 I'll tell you, program. the electron-to-proton mass ratio, right? It's one to... 10 by what? 30 some zeros. No, the electron to proton mass ratio is 1 in 2000. 1 in 2000? Yeah. The electron to proton mass ratio? Yeah, it's 1 in 2000. Yeah, the electron weighs 1 2000th the mass of the proton. It's good we're, we're doing a little education here. Okay, well, you're absolutely right. I'm not talking about 1 to 1, I'm talking about in the entire universe. Oh, no, the elect actually, there are an equal number of electrons to protons. The universe is new electrically neutral. All right, well, you got me there. Good, okay. You got me there. Point. I have to accept your word because... Well, you don't have to accept No, no on a matter of on. fact... I don't want you to accept anything I what, say. No, well, well, I'm so, skeptical of on a matter of you. fact, you've got your degree from, what, MIT? You were MIT, at Harvard, yeah. Yale, Case well, Western, ASU. Yeah. I By the way, I studied at ASU back in the 80s, artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. Then I went to McDonnell Douglas Helicopter Company, Microsoft, and been a talk show host ever since. Mm -hmm. But so, okay, I apologize. I'll correct that. What thing There's are, are the finely tuned. tuned parameters, right? There's the gravitational force constant. Yeah, the, it is what it is. Well, oh, what do you mean it's fine tuned? There's the electromagnetic force constant. There's the ratio of the number of electrons to protons. So, Which is one. All right. So yeah. the reason that so many astrophysicists, cosmologists, have gone to asserting the multiverse, that there are trillions upon trillions of universes, is because they say ours is such that... It is so wildly unlikely. No, there's no the good reason. reason for it to be here unless no, there no, were that's septillions. Not, that's, no, that's, that's not the case. And by the way, the multiverse is very speculative. And essentially, nothing, almost nothing that I've written about having to do with how the universe could come from nothing depends upon there being a multiverse. We've been driven to the multiverse by ideas in particle physics, which to some extent naturally predict the existence of many different universes. Now, there are certain parameters, and you didn't mention any of them, yeah. I think because you're not aware of them. Yeah, there are yeah. certain, which are, but in my book I describe them in detail. There are certain parameters like the energy of empty space that's very inexplicable. We can't understand why the energy of empty space is what it is. Yeah, right. And one of the arguments that's been presented, and it's been done 
a number of times throughout the history of science is called the anthropic principle, that namely, something along the lines of what you're saying, namely, if it were any different, then, then galaxies wouldn't form and life as we know wouldn't form, etc. So if, there, if it's a random event, then, then if it were any different, we wouldn't be here. Now, I should say that that's a plausible and possible answer, resolution of that problem, and it's motivated in some sense by the possible existence of many universes, which are predicted by many particle physics theories. Yeah. But in the, fact, in the past, when the anthropic principle has been applied to parameters we haven't understood, we've often found that, in fact, it's wrong, that we understand the parameters. It used to be the case for nuclear forces, that they had to be finely tuned so the stars would burn the way they were, and people thought, well, it's just anthropic. Well, now we have a fundamental theory called the strong interaction, which describes the interactions of quarks inside protons and neutrons that explains all that. And so all right. the, point, the point is that, yeah. you know, you're god of the gas Lawrence. argument, which I'm sure you don't really want to use. Lawrence. Just because we don't understand something, and if some scientists suggest one possibility is that it's a random variable, and it is what it is because we're here to measure it, is one possibility. But the fact that we don't understand it and, um, and, and it's inexplicable otherwise at present means there's a God. Well, that's a pretty bad argument, as you know, because right. the minute we understand it, your God's going to go out the window. Lawrence, in your book, as you've just said, you talk about nothing. <laughs> I mean, you talk about the geometry of space and the energy that fills the geometry of space. But to clarify, you're not denying, are you, that there are physicists around the world who have calculated the unlikely existence of these fine-tuned parameters and have looked at our universe and said that it is wildly, wildly no, I unlikely. No, I am denying that. Are you There's denying that? that? Yeah, I'm denying that because I'm no one shot. can calculate the probability answer. There are many people who are saying, look, the parameters of our universe seem rather strange. And maybe they're random, and, and it would be nice to calculate the probability that they occur. But we don't know the probability distribution over all universes because we don't know the underlying physics well, of and the this multiverse. Is, this so is no what's, one can calculate the probability distribution. Well, if they say they are, this is what This is what's driven people to say that there are at least 10 to the 500, 10 no, to the 500 that's, zeros that's, that's, sorry, universes. No, again, you got it wrong. Go Hold ahead. On. The reason that people say there may be 10 to the 500 universes is some people who think that string theory might be a, a, a good theory at the basis with, of quantum gravity which you don't have pointed like. out that right. string theory predicts 10 to the 500 different universes. Yeah, and there are other physicists who are saying that number, that's a paltry number compared to the number of universes. There must be virtually infinite. Well, and be. then lo and behold, we find ourselves here in this one where we're able to exist. I'm, well, the point is, all of that may be true. I don't see what the problem, what your problem well, is. Well, I am surprised. Can I just object for the record that you're denying that there are a legion of physicists who look at the parameters of the universe, gravitational force constant, electromagnetic force constant, and so on, and they say this is very unlikely, therefore there's likely trillions of universes and we happen to be in the one that supports our existence well i'm shocked that you deny that the case of people who stretch the truth you've got one or two things right but your conclusions are wrong there are many physicists who, yeah. who argue that the parameters of our universe are difficult to comprehend there are many physicists who point out that there are various fundamental theories that predict the existence of many different universes and therefore one possibility to explain the parameters that we see is that they are randomly distributed over universes, and we only exist in the universes that allow life. The problem with all of that, of course, is we don't even know what all sorts of intelligent life are. We don't know if the parameters of our universe are vastly different, whether a different source of intelligent life would, would evolve. We don't know even if we're typical of life in the universe. These when, are questions that are Lawrence, open questions at the forefront of physics, which is why we continue to look out instead of trying to assume we know all the answers. Lawrence, here, we here's, how it, we have the answers. here's how it looks to me. By the way, the book is A Universe from Nothing, Lawrence Krauss, afterward by Richard Dawkins. Uh, here's the way it looks to me. When Richard Dawkins joins the discoverer of DNA and so many atheists and evolutionists now, saying that perhaps... What, I don't know what you mean by atheists and evolutionists. I mean, well, there's some people who are atheists, so some people about. are evolutionists, some people what, are not. What do you mean by evolutionists? People who believe molecules to man evolution. Neo-Darwinism. Well, what do you mean? Well, as I said, can I tell you what they're anything. saying before... The we... people who accept the evidence of, of, yes, of, of those empirical people. science. The, <laughs> yes, those... I mean, the same people who believe the Earth the, is round, Those people. Well, the, the president of the Flat Earth Society is a Darwinist. Well, that, you know, they operate fine, but today. I'm just saying he's an idiot for being a president of Flat Earth. Society I agree with you. See, we agree on something. Yeah, uh, no, exactly. Lawrence, and all I'm saying is there, Lawrence, there are no scientists who aren't evolutionists. Can I make my no point? So you don't believe in gravity. 
Could I make my point so you okay. can tell me I'm wrong? They're on the same level of footing. When Richard Dawkins and so many atheists say that perhaps because of the complexity of molecular biology, they joined the discoverer of DNA in saying maybe life came here from aliens, they seeded life on Earth.